From worldwide protests over corruption and inequality to the popularity of socialist politicians like Jeremy Corbyn and Bernie Sanders, it's hard to get away from the idea that there's something very wrong with the global economic system. Even billionaires and business leaders talk openly about capitalism being broken. So is it really on the way out? Or are reports of capitalism's demise much exaggerated? Grace Blakely is an economics commentator at the New Statesman magazine in London and author of the new book, Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. Uh, Diego Zuluaga is a financial policy analyst at the Cato Institute in Washington, D.C., a libertarian and free market think tank. Thank you both for joining me in the arena. Um, how much are the recent protests that we've seen around the world in Latin America and the Middle East as well as the rise of politicians like Jeremy Corbyn, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, how much of all of that is about the explicit failure of capitalism to protect workers, uh, to share the proceeds of growth, to reduce inequality? Grace. I think specifically when you're looking at what's going on in Latin America at the moment, when you're looking at the massive pushback against these you know, international institutions that for decades have been implicit in foisting, or actually actively involved in foisting a very particular um, economic and political order on nations that simply, you know, democratically have rejected many of those policies. That is a significant source of, uh, of instability in many of those states. It's hardly surprising that people who are basically losing the right to vote to have a say over their economy are really getting angry about this stuff. When you actually look at the countries that are seeing protests, though, it's interesting because some of the countries that have the most virulent protests right now are the ones that have been most prosperous in the last three decades. Chile is by far the richest economy in Latin America. Inequality there has gone down, which hasn't happened, for example, in Venezuela. Uh, it's opened up and liberalized massively. It has trade agreements all so over the world. it's not economic discontent that's driving these protests in your I opinion. don't think it's primarily economic discontent, not discontent reflected by the figures anyway. In your new book, Stolen, you say, quote, we are currently living through the death throes of finance-led growth. What do you mean by that? So in the book, I talk about this idea of finance-led growth being um, a kind of model according to which economies, particularly in the global north, have been governed for a long time. It's kind of an institutional arrangement that privileges the interests of a small class. Basically, corporations become financialized. They're far more focused on their standing in Wall Street, the city, financial markets, and they will do anything to kind of boost their short-term share price, even at the expense of long-term investment and paying their workers. Um, and but death that throws debt lose. is a very strong phrase. Well, I mean, you know, it takes a, lot, a, a while for systems, economic and political systems, to break down, and we are seeing the cracks. I don't, I don't see this. the breakdown, Grace. I have to say, you know, you look over the last 30 years, and the big story of the last 30 years is a massive, massive reduction in extreme poverty, primarily driven by two things. One, since the late 1970s, China opening up to the world which had 900 million poor at the time that it opened up, and now has less than 100 million, still 100 million too many, but a massive improvement. And then since the 90s, India doing the same thing. That's the dramatic story of the last 30 years. Now, in terms of indebtedness in developed countries and increasing inequality within developed countries, that is a phenomenon that I am concerned about, and one that is, I think, driven a lot of the time by regulatory restrictions that benefit the people who own assets at the expense of everybody else. But you look at the developing world, and inequality globally has actually gone down. The, it is happening. The, the China case is really interesting, right? Because the way that China has got to the position it's in today is by breaking all the rules that those international institutions would want to impose on it. It has had capital controls, it's had exchange controls, it has mass state ownership of many of the most important institutions in, um, in the economy, mass state ownership of, of the banking system, of you know, big enterprises. Much less than it used to which has, Yeah, but that is why it's been able to weather the storm, whereas I disagree. other countries the, the main, the main, dri the main driver has been foreign direct investment from other countries and the fact that foreign capital could move in. The main driver of China's growth over the last 10 years has been state investment. In fact, that's basically been the only... Right, but the, but the last... That, the last right. 10 years is the smallest bit of this whole period. But right? Diego, I want to put a point to you. Isn't the problem for your way of looking at the world that it's not just socialists or people on the left uh, who are saying capitalism has major problems, whether it's inequality or stagnant growth. It's also the International Monetary Fund, the World Economic Forum, the World Bank. Hardcore capitalist institutions are saying this stuff. It's yeah, not well, some left-wing plot. No, I mean, I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a left-wing plot, but I think the narrative has to be differentiated here. It, there's a difference between pointing out specific problems with the global economy right now, yeah. and I think there are plenty of them, but I think most of the time they're driven by misguided interventions by specific national governments, uh, whereas the trend and the general adoption of free markets around the world in the last 30 years, there is no question that it's improved the welfare. Well, hold, hold on, hold on. Worst of all. On that note, when and, hedge fund billionaire Ray Dalio, for example, says yeah. capitalism must evolve or die, that it's not working for the majority of people, do you agree with him? 
No, I don't, actually. No, I think, the, as I say, the main driver, what we want to eradicate is situations where people cannot satisfy their basic necessities and cannot flourish in a humane way around the world. And I think we haven't had a period in the history of the world, like the last 30 years, in which the vast majority of the global population, even in the most deprived places, have suddenly and finally gained access to the most basic essentials and necessities. And that has been driven universally by liberalization. I actually agree with the point that a lot of this has been driven by governments, right? Um, I think we have to look at capitalism as a, a joint venture, as it were, between the free market and a, a particular cap like form of, uh, of capitalist state. And they have often, over the last 40 years, whether you look at Thatcherism in Britain, Reaganism in America, you know, various, you know, Pinochet in Chile, right? States have worked with markets to actually break down um, protections that you, had existed so for what, you, so people. What's, what's your model, Grace? What country would My be an example? My model is, is real democracy. And this is the thing but that no, this is what, a specific country. This is that this you would is look what, what uh, Jeremy Corbyn and, and, and Bernie Sanders are promising is something that has not existed. Before, but that's what they're promising. Diego's socialism. asking for a real world example because often critics of socialism will say Venezuela, Cuba at the extreme end, North Korea. Is there real-world examples that people like yourself can point to and say, no, this works, what I'm there calling are, for, there are plenty this of, works? There are plenty of examples of, you know, social democratic states, if not socialist states, providing much higher standards of living for the majority of their citizens. That's something that I think we can... What's one? Or, 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 all the Nordic countries, right? You know, well, they have... It's, it's interesting you bring them up. They have higher rates of union... Let, uh, me, uh, let me tell you something. They have better uh, no. health outcomes, better education outcomes, all these sorts of okay, things. OK, Diego, um, a, few, a few things that people don't realise of a Nordic economy is Sweden has the highest wealth inequality in all of Europe. It's privatised the schools, it's privatised a lot of the hospitals. I agree with you, it has very high standards of living and a very large safety net that helps a lot of people, but it's not the picture that Bernie Sanders and is selling what I was us. going to say was that those countries have historically had, you know, much better outcomes because they've had a bigger role for the state in providing all of these things. That's not but quite right. over the last 30, no. 40 years, those uh, protections, pub uh, social institutions, public services have been eroded. If you look at the most prosperous countries in the world, they have the rule of law, they have very well-protected property rights, and they have a big role for markets even within the provision of public services. And if you look I'm at talking the about New Zealand, the world, Australia, Nordic, or Nordic countries, Germany, France even, they're beginning to adopt those yeah. models as well. Diego, isn't, so Diego isn't the problem, one thing I often find when people in the US in particular have this debate about capitalism, socialism, they say, oh, socialism's really bad, Venezuela, and then you say, what about the Nordic countries? And then you say, oh, actually, they're capitalist countries just like us. When you can't have it both ways. If they're so similar to the US, then why doesn't the US do what those countries are doing in terms of healthcare regulation? Well, it does to a very ownership. large extent and usually much more... You think more the US economy is similar to the Norwegian economy? In many ways, it is, yeah. I mean, it's open to trade. It has free capital mobility. It doesn't have the same level of healthcare. It doesn't have the same level of wages, he, minimum wage. Maybe the taxpayer pays for more healthcare in Sweden, but the provision of healthcare is in many ways the same as it is in the United there States. There is a point there. That's not true. It is. It's not universal in the United States. There is a point there, which is that both systems are capitalist systems, as in they are uh, economies in which um, there is private ownership of the most important uh, resources we need to produce stuff, um, and that those resources are used to maximise profit, and that is supported by the state. What socialists today are arguing for is a step beyond that is socialised ownership of all the stuff we need to produce things and is democracy in our economy as well as in our politics. That means worker ownership of firms. It means, you know, workers actually making the decisions about what we should be producing. It means democratic control of our public services. It means a democratic... Just to be clear, are you system. saying that the public, the government should own all public services, all utilities? I'm saying that there should be different models of ownership, so there should be nationalised ownership of some things that are natural monopolies, but primarily we need an economy that is run by people for people. We, we have tried this before, right? I mean, worker ownership was something that was tried in socialist Yugoslavia. It was originally the model for the Soviet Union, and steadily the state took over more and more roles. In Yugoslavia, it was simply deeply inefficient. It's an economy that was stagnant for decades. It, this is not a novel argument, and it's a very inefficient way, the evidence suggests, to organise an economy, it's because just, workers just a quick, don't want the answer. Just Looking before at, we run yeah. out of time, I do have to ask a big question before we run out of time. How much does climate change play a role in it's, your arguments? It's completely changed the game. It is going to be impossible to solve the climate crisis under capitalism, and it provides so much urgency to those movements that are actually seeking to provide a better life I for their children. I couldn't disagree more, Mehdi and, and Grace. I have to say, you look at the environmental record record of the socialist economies all across history, and it's been terribly poor. Lake Baikal in Russia is completely drained as a result of state management of but the economy. Again, Why? no one's saying no, state socialism. Me. No one's saying we're well, going you, you to the USSR. You weren't, you weren't this is able, about democracy. But, but they weren't able to give but a single but example but of a the greatest, But the, the greatest polluter in human history is the United States of America, the world's most famous capitalist economy. You wouldn't deny that.
Well, I mean, but look at the evolution of carbon emissions in the United States in the last 10 years. It's innovation driven by private markets. Do you, uh, us just, I just have pollution. to put this on the record here. I know you work for the Cato Institute, which is funded by the Koch brothers. You, you believe in man-caused climate change? Of course. Yeah. Okay. And you think steps should be taken to tackle it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And they will be driven by innovation and private by markets. By capitalism, in the way that they not in spite have. of cap. You think capitalism can solve the climate change it's crisis? The only tool, it's the only effective tool to do so if we look at the historical evidence. We'll have to leave it there. Diego, Grace, thank you both for joining me in the arena. That's our show. Upfront, we'll be back next week.